Welcome to Classics You Slept Through. Today we'll be reading The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, chapters 1 through 3. Preface The artist is the creator of beautiful things. To reveal art and conceal the artist is art's aim. The critic is he who can translate into another manner or a new material his impression of beautiful things. The highest, as the lowest form of criticism, is a mode of autobiography. Those who find ugly meanings in beautiful things are corrupt without being charming. This is a fault. Those who find beautiful meanings in beautiful things are the cultivated. For these, there is hope. They are the elect to whom beautiful things mean only beauty. There is no such thing as a moral or an immoral book. Books are well-written or badly written. That is all. The 19th century dislike of realism is the rage of Caliban seeing his own face in a glass. The 19th century dislike of romanticism is the rage of Caliban not seeing his own face in a glass. The moral life of man forms part of the subject matter of the artist, but the morality of art consists in the perfect use of an imperfect medium. No artist desires to prove anything. Even things that are true can be proved. No artist has ethical sympathies. An ethical sympathy in an artist is an unpardonable mannerism of style. No artist is ever morbid. The artist can express everything. Thought and language are to the artist instruments of an art. Vice and virtue are to the artist materials for an art. From the point of view of form, the type of all the arts is the art of the musician. From the point of view of feeling, the actor's craft is the type. All art is at once surface and symbol. Those who go beneath the surface do so at their peril. Those who read the symbol do so at their peril. It is the spectator, and not life, that art really mirrors. Diversity of opinion about a work of art shows that the work is new, complex, and vital. When critics disagree, the artist is in accord with himself. We can forgive a man for making a useful thing, as long as he does not admire it. The only excuse for making a useless thing is that one admires it intensely. All art is quite useless. Oscar Wilde Chapter 1 the studio was filled with the rich odor of roses, and when the light summer wind stirred amidst the trees of the garden, there came through the open door the heavy scent of the lilac, or the more delicate perfume of the pink flowering thorn. From the corner of the divan of Persian saddlebags in which he was lying, smoking, as was his custom, innumerable cigarettes, Lord Henry Wotton could just catch the gleam of the honey-sweet and honey-colored blossoms of laburnum, whose tremulous branches seemed hardly able to bear the burden of a beauty so flame-like as theirs. And now and then the fantastic shadows of birds in flight flitted across the long tusser silk curtains that were stretched in front of the huge window, producing a kind of momentary Japanese effect, and making him think of those pallid jade-faced painters of Tokyo who, through the medium of an art that is necessarily immobile, seek to convey the sense of swiftness and motion. The sullen murmur of the bees shouldering their way through the long, unmown grass or circling with monotonous insistence round the dusty gilt horns of the straggling woodbine seemed to make the stillness more oppressive. The dim roar of London was like the burdened note of a distant organ. In the center of the room, clamped to an upright easel, stood the full-length portrait of a young man of extraordinary personal beauty, and in front of it, some little distance away, was sitting the artist himself, Basil Hallward, whose sudden disappearance some years ago caused, at the time, such public excitement and gave rise to so many strange conjectures. As the painter looked at the gracious and comely form he had so skillfully mirrored in his art, a smile of pleasure passed across his face and seemed about to linger there. But he suddenly started up, and closing his eyes, placed his fingers upon the lids, as though he sought to imprison within his brain some curious dream 
from which he feared he might awake. It is your best work, Basil, the best thing you've ever done, said Lord Henry languidly. You must certainly send it next year to the Grosnever. The academy is too large and too vulgar. Whenever I've gone there, there have been either so many people that have not been able to see the pictures, which was dreadful, or so many pictures that have not been able to see the people, which was worse. The Grosnever is really the only place. I don't think I shall send it anywhere, he answered tossing his head back in that odd way that used to make his friends laugh at him at Oxford. No, I won't send it anywhere. Lord Henry elevated his eyebrows and looked at him in amazement through the thin blue wreaths of smoke that curled up in such fanciful whirls from his heavy opium-tainted cigarette. Not send it anywhere? My dear fellow, why? Have you any reason? What odd chaps you painters are. You do anything in the world to gain a reputation. As soon as you have one, you seem to want to throw it away. It is silly of you, for there's only one thing in the world worse than being talked about, and that is not being talked about. A portrait like this would set you far above all the young men in England, and make the old men quite jealous, if old men are ever capable of any emotion. I know you will laugh at me, he replied but I really can't exhibit it. I've put too much of myself into it. Lord Henry stretched himself out on the divan and laughed. Yes, I knew you would. But it is quite true all the same. Too much of yourself in it. Upon my word, Basil, I didn't know you were so vain. I really can't see any resemblance between you, with your rugged, strong face and your coal-black hair, and this young Adonis who... Looks as if he were made out of ivory and rose leaves. Why, my dear Basil, he is a narcissist. And you, well, of course you have an intellectual expression and all that. But beauty, real beauty, ends where an intellectual expression begins. Intellect is in itself a mode of exaggeration and destroys the harmony of any face. The moment one sits down to think... One becomes all nose, or all forehead, or something horrid. Look at these successful men in any of the learned professions. How perfectly hideous they are. Except, of course, the church. But then in the church they don't think. A bishop keeps on saying at the age of eighty what he was told to say when he was a boy of eighteen. As a natural consequence, he always looks absolutely delightful. Your mysterious young friend whose name you have never told me, but whose picture really fascinates me, never thinks. I feel quite sure of that. He is some brainless, beautiful creature who should be always here in winter when we have no flowers to look at, and always here in summer when we want something to chill our intelligence. Don't flatter yourself, Basil. You are not in the least like him. You don't understand me, Harry, answered the artist. Of course I'm not like him. I know that perfectly well. Indeed, I should be sorry to look like him. You shrug your shoulders? I'm telling you the truth. There's a fatality about all physical and intellectual distinction. The sort of fatality that seems to dog through history the faltering steps of kings. It's better to not be different from one's fellows. The ugly and the stupid have the best of it in this world. They can sit at their ease and gape and play. If they know nothing of victory, they are at least spared the knowledge of defeat. They live as we all should live, undisturbed, indifferent, and without disquiet. They neither bring ruin upon others, nor ever receive it from alien hands. Your rank and wealth, Harry, my brains, such as they are, my art, whatever it may be worth, Dorian Gray's good looks, we shall all suffer for what the gods have given us, suffer terribly. Dorian Gray, is that his name? asked Lord Henry, walking across the studio towards Basil Hallworth. Yes, that is his name. I didn't intend to tell it to you. But why not? No, oh, I can't explain. When I like people immensely, I never tell their names to anyone. It is like surrendering a part of them. I've grown to love secrecy. It seems to be the one thing that can make modern life mysterious or marvelous to us. 
The commonest thing is delightful, if one only hides it. When I leave town now, I never tell my people where I'm going. If I did, I would lose all my pleasure. It is a silly habit, I dare say, but somehow it seems to bring a great deal of romance into one's life. I suppose you think me awfully foolish about it. Not at all, answered Lord Henry. Not at all, my dear Basil. You seem to forget that I'm married, and the one charm of marriage is it makes a life of deception absolutely necessary for both parties. I never know where my wife is, and my wife never knows what I'm doing. When we meet, we do meet occasionally, when we dine out together or go down to the Duke's. We tell each other the most absurd stories with the most serious faces. My wife is very good at it, much better, in fact, than I am. She never gets confused over her dates, and I always do. But when she does find me out, she makes no row at all. I sometimes wish she would, but she merely laughs at me. I hate the way you talk about your married life, Harry, said Basil Hallward, strolling towards the door that led into the garden. I believe that you really are a very good husband, that you are thoroughly ashamed of your own virtues. You are an extraordinary fellow. You never say a moral thing, and you never do a wrong thing. Your cynicism is simply a pose. Being natural is simply a pose, and the most irritating pose I know, cried Lord Henry, laughing. And the two men went out into the garden together, and ensconced themselves on a long bamboo seat that stood in the shade of a tall laurel bush. The sunlight slipped over the polished leaves. In the grass, white daisies were tremulous. After a pause, Lord Henry pulled out his watch. I'm afraid I must be going, Basil, he murmured. And before I go, I insist on your answering a question I put to you some time ago. What is that, said the painter, keeping his eyes fixed on the ground. You know quite well. I do not, Harry. Well, I will tell you what it is. I want you to explain to me why you won't exhibit Dorian Gray's picture. I want the real reason. Told you the real reason. No, you did not. You said it was because there was too much of yourself in it. Now that is childish. Harry, said Basil Hallward, looking him straight in the face. Every portrait that is painted with feeling is a portrait of the artist, not of the sitter. The sitter is merely the accident, the occasion. It is not he who is revealed by the painter. It is rather the painter who, on the colored canvas, reveals himself. The reason I will not exhibit this picture is that I am afraid I have shown in it the secret of my own soul. Lord Henry laughed. And what is that, he asked. I will tell you, said Hallward. But an expression of perplexity came over his face. I am all expectation, Basil, continued his companion, glancing at him. Oh, there's really very little to tell, Harry, answered the painter. I'm afraid you'll hardly understand it. Perhaps you'll hardly believe it. Lord Henry smiled, and leaning down, plucked a pink-petaled daisy from the grass and examined it. I'm quite sure I shall understand it, he replied, gazing intently at the little golden, white-feathered disc. And as for believing things, I can believe anything, provided that it's quite incredible. The wind shook some blossoms from the trees, and the heavy lilac blooms, with their clustering stars, moved to and fro in the languid air. A grasshopper began to chirp by the wall, and like a blue thread, a long, thin dragonfly floated past on its brown gauze wings. Lord Henry felt as if he could hear Basil Hallward's heart beating and wondered what was coming. The story is simply this, said the painter, after some time. Two months ago, I went to a crush at Lady Brandon's. You know, we poor artists have to show ourselves in society from time to time, just to remind the public that we are not savages. With an evening coat and a white tie, as you once told me, anybody, even a stockbroker, can gain a reputation for being civilized. Well, after I'd been in the room about ten minutes, talking to huge overdressed dowagers and tedious academicians, 
I suddenly became conscious that someone was looking at me. I turned halfway round and saw Dorian Gray for the first time. When our eyes met, I felt that I was growing pale. A curious sensation of terror came over me. I knew that I'd come face to face with someone whose mere personality was so fascinating that if I allowed it to do so, it would absorb my whole nature, my whole soul, my very art itself. I did not want any external influence in my life. You know yourself, Harry, how independent I am by nature. I've always been my own master. Had at least always been so, till I met Dorian Gray. Then, but I don't know how to explain it to you. Something seemed to tell me that I was on the verge of a terrible crisis in my life. I had a strange feeling that fate had in store for me exquisite joys and exquisite sorrows. I grew afraid and turned to quit the room. It was not conscience that made me do so. It was a sort of cowardice. I take no credit to myself for trying to escape. Conscience and cowardice are really the same things, Basil. Conscience is the trade name of the firm. That is all. I don't believe that, Harry. I don't believe that you do either. However... Whatever was my motive, and it may have been pride, for I used to be very proud, I certainly struggled to the door. There, of course, I stumbled against Lady Brandon. You're not going to run away so soon, Mr. Hallward, she screamed out. You know her curiously shrill voice. Yes, she's a peacock and everything but beauty, said Lord Henry, pulling the daisy to bits with his long, nervous fingers. I could not get rid of her. She brought me up to royalties and people with stars and garters and elderly ladies with gigantic tiaras and parrot noses. She spoke of me as her dearest friend. I had only met her once before, but she took it into her head to lionize me. I believe some picture of mine had made a great success at the time, at least it had been chatted about in the penny newspapers, which is the 19th century standard of immortality. Suddenly, I found myself face to face with a young man, whose personality had so strangely stirred me. We were quite close, almost touching. Our eyes met again. It was reckless of me, but I asked Lady Brandon to introduce me to him. Perhaps it was not so reckless after all. It was simply inevitable. We would have spoken to each other without any introduction. I'm sure of that. Dorian told me so afterwards. He, too, felt that we were destined to know each other. And how did Lady Brandon describe this wonderful young man? asked his companion. I know she goes in for giving a rapid priestess of all her guests. I remember her bringing me up to a truculent and red-faced old gentleman, covered all over with orders and ribbons and hissing into my ear in a tragic whisper which must have been perfectly audible to everyone in the room. The most astounding details... I simply fled. I like to find out people for myself. But Lady Brandon treats her guests exactly as an auctioneer treats his goods. She either explains them entirely away or tells one everything about them, except what one wants to know. Poor Lady Brandon. You are hard on her, Harry, said Hallward listlessly. My dear fellow, she tried to found a salon and only succeeded in opening a restaurant. How could I admire her? But tell me, what did she say about Mr. Dorian Gray? Oh, something like, charming boy, poor dear mother and I are absolutely inseparable, quite forget what he does, afraid he doesn't do anything. Oh, yes, plays the piano. Or is it the violin, dear Mr. Gray? <laughs> Neither of us could help laughing and we became friends at once. Laughter is not at all a bad beginning for friendship, and it is far the best ending for one, said the young lord, plucking another daisy. Hallward shook his head. You don't understand what friendship is, Harry, he murmured, or what enmity is for that matter. You like everyone. That is to say, you are indifferent to everyone. How horribly unjust of you, cried Lord Henry, tilting his hat back and 
looking up at the little clouds that were like ravel skeins of glossy white silk or drifting across the hollow turquoise of the summer sky. Yes, horribly unjust of you. I make a great difference between people. I choose my friends for their good looks, my acquaintances for their good characters, and my enemies for their good intellects. A man cannot be too careful in the choice of his enemies. I have not got one who is a fool. They are all men of some intellectual power, and consequently, they all appreciate me. Is that very vain of me? I think it's rather vain. I should think it was, Harry. But according to your category, I must merely be an acquaintance. My dear old Basil, you are much more than an acquaintance. And much less than a friend. A sort of brother, I suppose. Oh, brothers. I don't care for brothers. My elder brother won't die, and my younger brothers seem to never do anything else. Harry, exclaimed Hallward, frowning. My dear fellow, I'm not quite serious, but I can't help detesting my relations. I suppose it comes from the fact that none of us can stand other people having the same faults as ourselves. I quite sympathize with the rage of the English democracy against what they call the vices of the upper orders. The masses feel that drunkenness, stupidity, and immorality should be their own special property, and that if any one of us makes an ass of himself, his poaching on their preserves. When poor Southwark got into the divorce court, their indignation was quite magnificent. Yet I don't suppose that ten percent of the proletariat live correctly. I don't agree with a single word you've said. And what is more, Harry, I feel sure you don't either. Lord Henry stroked his pointed brown beard and tapped the toe of his patent leather boot with a tasseled ebony cane. How English you are, Basil. That's the second time you've made that observation. If one puts forward an idea to a true Englishman, always a rash thing to do, he never dreams of considering whether the idea is right or wrong. The only thing he considers of any importance is whether one believes it oneself. Now, the value of an idea has nothing whatsoever to do with the sincerity of the man who expresses it. Indeed, the probabilities are that the more insincere the man is, the more purely intellectual will the idea be, as in that case it will not be colored by either his wants, his desires, or his prejudices. However, I don't propose to discuss politics, sociology, or metaphysics with you. I like persons better than principles. I like persons with no principles better than anything else in the world. Tell me more about Mr. Dorian Gray. How often do you see him? Every day. I couldn't be happy if I didn't see him every day. He is absolutely necessary to me. How extraordinary. I thought you would never care for anything but your art. He is all my art to me now, said the painter gravely. I sometimes think, Harry, that there are only two eras of any importance in the world's history. The first is the appearance of a new medium for art, and the second is the appearance of a new personality for art also. What the invention of oil painting was to the Venetians, the face of Antonius was to late Greek sculpture, and the face of Dorian Gray will some day be to me. It is not merely that I paint from him, draw from him, sketch from him. Of course, I have done all that, but he is much more to me than a model or a sitter. I won't tell you that I'm dissatisfied with what I have done of him, or that his beauty is such that art cannot express it. There's nothing that art cannot express, and I know the work I've done since I met Dorian Gray. It's good work. It's the best work of my life. But, in some curious way, I wonder, will you understand me? His personality has suggested to me an entirely new manner in art, an entirely new mode of style. I see things differently. I think of them differently. I can now recreate life in a way that was hidden from me before. A dream of form and days of thought. Who is it who says that? I forget. But it is what Dorian Gray has been to me. 
the merely visible presence of this lad, for he seems to me little more than a lad, though he's really over twenty. His merely visible presence. Oh, I wonder can you realize all that that means? Unconsciously, he defines for me the lines of a fresh school, a school that is to have in it all the passion of the romantic spirit, all the perfection of the spirit that is Greek, the harmony of soul and body, how much that is. We in our madness have separated the two and have invented a realism that is vulgar, an ideality that is void. Harry, if you only knew what Dorian Gray is to me, you remember that landscape of mine, for which Agnew offered me such a huge price, which I would not part with? It is one of the best things I've ever done. And why is it so? Because, while I was painting it, Dorian Gray sat beside me. Some subtle influence passed from him to me, and for the first time in my life, I saw in the plain woodland the wonder I had always looked for and always missed. Basil, this is extraordinary. I must see Dorian Gray. Hallward got up from the seat and walked down the garden. After some time, he came back. Harry, he said, Dorian Gray is to me simply a motive in art. You might see nothing in him. I see everything in him. He is never more present in my work than when no image of him is there. He is a suggestion, as I have said, of a new manner. I find in him the curves of certain lines, in the loveliness and subtleties of certain colors. That is all. Then why won't you exhibit his portrait? asked Lord Henry. Because, without intending it, I have put into it some expression of all this curious artistic idolatry, of which, of course, I have never cared to speak to him. He knows nothing about it. He shall never know anything about it. But the world might guess it. I will not bear my soul to their shallow, prying eyes. My heart shall never be put under their microscope. There is too much of myself in the thing, Harry. Too much of myself. Poets are not so scrupulous as you are. They know how useful passion is for publication. Nowadays a broken heart will run to many editions. I hate them for it, cried Hallward. An artist should create beautiful things, but should put nothing of his own life into them. We live in an age when men treat art as if it were meant to be a form of autobiography. We have lost the abstract sense of beauty. Someday I will show the world what it is. And for that reason, the world shall never see my portrait of Dorian Gray. I think you're wrong, Basil, but I won't argue with you. It is only the intellectually lost who ever argue. And tell me, is Dorian Gray very fond of you? The painter considered for a few moments. He likes me, he answered after a pause. I know he likes me. Of course, I flatter him dreadfully. I find a strange pleasure in saying things to him that I know I shall be sorry for having said. As a rule, he is charming to me, and we sit in the studio and talk of a thousand things. Now and then, however, he is horribly thoughtless and seems to take a real delight in giving me pain. Then I feel, Harry, that I have given away my whole soul to someone who treats it as if it were a flower to put in his coat, a bit of decoration to charm his vanity, an ornament for a summer day. Days in summer, Basil, are apt to linger, murmured Lord Henry. Perhaps you will tire sooner than he will. It's a sad thing to think of, but... There's no doubt that genius lasts longer than beauty, and that accounts for the fact that we all take such pains to over-educate ourselves. In the wild struggle for existence, we want to have something that endures, 
And so we fill our minds with rubbish and facts in the silly hope of keeping our place. A thoroughly well-informed man. <laughs> That's the modern ideal. And the mind of the thoroughly well-informed man is a dreadful thing. It is like a bric-a-brac shop, all monsters and dust, with everything priced above its proper value. I think you will tire first, all the same. Someday you will look at your friend, and he will seem to you to be a little out of drawing, or you won't like his tone of color or something. You will bitterly reproach him in your own heart, and seriously think that he has behaved very badly to you. The next time he calls, you will be perfectly cold and indifferent. It will be a great pity, for it will alter you. What you've told me is quite a romance. A romance of art, one might call it. And the worst of having a romance of any kind is that it leaves one so unromantic. Harry, don't talk like that. As long as I live, the personality of Dorian Gray will dominate me. You can't feel what I feel. You change too often. Oh, my dear Basil. That is exactly why I can feel it. Those who are faithful know only the trivial sides of love. It is the faithless who know love's tragedies. And Lord Henry struck a light on the dainty silver case and began to smoke a cigarette with a self-conscious and satisfied air, as if he had summed up the world in phrase. There was a rustle of chirping sparrows in the green lacquer leaves of the ivy, and the blue cloud shadows chased themselves across the grass like swallows. How pleasant it was in the garden. How delightful other people's emotions were. Much more delightful than their ideas, it seemed to him. One's own soul and the passions of one's friends, those were the fascinating things in life. He pictured to himself with silent amusement the tedious luncheon that he had missed by staying so long with Basil Hallward. Had he gone to his aunt's, he'd have been sure to have met Lord Goodbody there. The whole conversation would have been about the feeding of the poor and the necessity for model lodging houses. Each class would have preached the importance of those virtues for whose exercise there was no necessity in their own lives. The rich would have spoken on the value of thrift, and the idle grown eloquent over the dignity of labor. It was charming to have escaped all that. As he thought of his aunt, an idea seemed to strike him. He turned to Hallward and said, My dear fellow, I have just remembered. Remembered what, Harry? Where I heard the name of Dorian Gray. Where was it? asked Hallward, with a slight frown. Don't look so angry, Basil. It was at my aunt, Lady Agatha's. She told me she had discovered a wonderful young man who was going to help her in the East End, and that his name was Dorian Gray. I am bound to state that she never told me he was good-looking. Women have no appreciation of good looks. At least... Good women have not. She said that he was very earnest and had a beautiful nature. Huh, I had once pictured to myself a creature with spectacles and lank hair, horribly freckled and tramping about on huge feet. I wish I had known it was your friend. I'm very glad you didn't, Harry. Why? I don't want you to meet him. You don't want me to meet him? No. Mr. Dorian Gray in the studio, sir, said the butler, coming into the garden. You must introduce me now, cried Henry, laughing. The painter turned to his servant, who stood blinking in the sunlight. Ask Mr. Gray to wait, Parker. I shall be in in a few moments. The man bowed and went up the walk. Then he looked at Lord Henry. Dorian Gray is my dearest friend, he said. He has a simple and beautiful nature. Your aunt was quite right in what she said of him. Don't spoil him. Don't try to influence him. Your influence would be bad. The world is wide and has many marvelous people in it. Don't take away from me the one person who gives to my art whatever charm it possesses. 
My life as an artist depends on him. Mind, Harry, I trust you. He spoke very slowly, and the words seemed wrung out of him, almost against his will. What nonsense you talk, said Lord Henry, smiling, and taking Hallward by the arm, he almost led him into the house. Chapter 2 As they entered, they saw Dorian Gray. He was seated at the piano with his back to them, turning over the pages of a volume of Schumann's forest scenes. You must lend me these, Basil, he cried. I want to learn them. They are perfectly charming. That entirely depends on how you sit today, Dorian. Oh, I'm tired of sitting. I don't want a life-size portrait of myself, answered the lad, swinging round on the music stool in a willful, petulant manner. When he caught sight of Lord Henry, a faint blush colored his cheeks for a moment, and he started up. I beg your pardon, Basil, but I didn't know you had anyone with you. This is Lord Henry Wotton, Dorian, an old Oxford friend of mine. I've just been telling him what a capital sitter you were, and now you've spoiled everything. You've not spoiled my pleasure in meeting you, Mr. Gray, said Lord Henry, stepping forward and extending his hand. My aunt has often spoken to me about you. You're one of her favorites, and, I'm afraid, one of her victims also. I'm in Lady Agatha's black books at present, answered Dorian, with a funny look of penitence. I promised to go to a club in Whitechapel with her last Tuesday, and I really forgot all about it. We were to have played a duet together. Three duets, I believe. I don't know what she'll say to me. I'm far too frightened to call. Oh, I'll make peace with my aunt. She is quite devoted to you. And I don't really think it matters about you not being there. The audience probably thought it was a duet. When Aunt Agatha sits down at the piano, she makes quite enough noise for two people. <laughs> That's very horrid to her. Not very nice to me, answered Dorian, laughing. Lord Henry looked at him. Yes, he was certainly wonderfully handsome with his finely curved scarlet lips, his frank blue eyes, his crisp gold hair. There was something in his face that made one trust him at once. All the candor of youth was there, as well as all youth's passionate purity. One felt that he had kept himself unspotted from the world. No wonder Basil Hallward worshipped him. You are too charming to go in for philanthropy, Mr. Gray. Far too charming. And Lord Henry flung himself down the divan and opened his cigarette case. The painter had been busy mixing his colors and getting his brushes ready. He was looking worried, and when he heard Lord Henry's last remark, he glanced at him, hesitated for a moment, and then said, Harry, I want to finish this picture today. Would you think it awfully rude of me? if I asked you to go away. Lord Henry smiled and looked at Dorian Gray. Am I to go, Mr. Gray? he asked. Oh, please don't, Lord Henry. I see that Basil's in one of his sulky moods, and I can't bear him when he sulks. Besides, I want you to tell me why I should not go in for philanthropy. I don't know what I shall tell you on that, Mr. Gray. It is so tedious a subject one would have to talk seriously about it. But I certainly shall not run away, now that you've asked me to stop. You don't really mind, Basil, do you? You've often told me you like your sitters to have someone to chat to. Hallward bit his lip. If Dorian wishes it, of course you must stay. Dorian's whims are laws to everybody, except himself. Lord Henry took up his hat and gloves. You're very pressing, Basil. But I am afraid I must go. I have promised to meet a man at the Orleans. Goodbye, Mr. Gray. Come see me some afternoon in Curzon Street. I'm nearly always home at five o'clock. Write to me when you're coming. I should be sorry to miss you. Basil, cried Dorian Gray. If Lord Henry Wotton goes, I shall go too. You never open your lips when you're painting, and it's horribly dull standing on a platform and trying to look pleasant. Ask him to stay. I insist upon it. Stay, Harry. 
To oblige Dorian and to oblige me, said Hallward, gazing intently at his picture. It is quite true. I never talk when I'm working, and never listen either. It must be dreadfully tedious for my unfortunate sitters. I beg you to stay. But what about my man at the Orleans? The painter laughed. <laughs> I don't think there'll be any difficulty about that. Sit down again, Harry. And now, Dorian, get up on that platform. And don't move about too much, or pay any attention to what Lord Henry says. He has a very bad influence over all his friends, with the single exception of myself. Dorian Gray stepped up on the dais with the air of a young Greek martyr, and made a little moo of discontent to Lord Henry, to whom he had rather taken a fancy. He was so unlike Basil. They made a delightful contrast, and he had such a beautiful voice. After a few moments, he said to him, Have you really a very bad influence, Lord Henry? As bad as Basil says? It's no such thing as a good influence, Mr. Gray. All influence is immoral. Immoral from the scientific point of view. Why? Because to influence a person is to give him one's own soul. He does not think his natural thoughts or burn with his natural passions. His virtues are not real to him. His sins, if there are such things as sins, are borrowed. It becomes an echo of someone else's music, an actor of a part that has not been written for him. The aim of life is self-development, to realize one's nature perfectly. That is what each of us is here for. People are afraid of themselves nowadays. They've forgotten the highest of all duties, the duty that one owes to oneself. Of course, they are charitable. They feed the hungry and clothe the beggar. But their own souls starve and are naked. Courage has gone out of our race. Perhaps we never really had it. The terror of society, which is the basis of morals, the terror of God, which is the secret of religion, these are the two things that govern us, and yet... Just turn your head a little more to the right, Dorian, like a good boy, said the painter, deep in his work, and conscious only that a look had come into the lad's face that he had never seen there before. And yet, continued Lord Henry, in his low, musical voice, and with that graceful wave of the hand that was always so characteristic of him, and that he had even in his eaten days. I believe that if one man were to live out his life fully and completely, were to give form to every feeling, expression to every thought, reality to every dream, I believe the world would gain such a fresh impulse of joy that we would forget all the maladies of medievalism and return to the Hellenic ideal, to be something finer, Richer than the Hellenic ideal, it may be. But the bravest man among us is afraid of himself. The mutilation of the savage has its tragic survival in the self-denial that mars our lives. We're punished for our refusals. Every impulse that we strive to strangle broods in the mind and poisons us. The body sins once and has done with its sin, for action it was a mode of purification. Nothing remains, then, but the recollection of a pleasure or the luxury of a regret. The only way to get rid of a temptation is to yield to it. Resist it, and your soul grows sick with longing for the things that it has forbidden to itself, with desire for what its monstrous laws have made monstrous and unlawful. It has been said that the great events of the world take place in the brain. It is in the brain, and the brain only, that the great sins of the world take place also. You, Mr. Gray, you yourself, with your rose-red youth and your rose-white boyhood, you have had passions that have made you afraid, thoughts that have filled you with terror, daydreams and sleeping dreams, whose mere memory might stain your cheek with shame. Stop, faltered Dorian Gray. Stop. You bewilder me. 
I don't know what to say. There's some answer to you, but I cannot find it. Uh, don't speak. Uh, let me think. Or rather, uh, let me try not to think. For nearly ten minutes he stood there, motionless, with parted lips and eyes strangely bright. He was dimly conscious that entirely fresh influences were at work within him. Yet they seemed to him to have come really from himself. A few words that Basil's friend had said to him, words spoken by chance, no doubt, and with willful paradox in them, had touched some secret chord that had never been touched before, but that he felt now was vibrating and throbbing to curious pulses. Music had stirred him like that. Music had troubled him many times. But music was not articulate. It was not a new world, but rather another chaos that it creates in us. Words. Mere words. How terrible they were. How clear and vivid and cruel. One could not escape from them. And yet, what a subtle magic there was in them. They seemed to be able to give a plastic form to formless things and have a music of their own as sweet as that of the viol or of the lute. Mere words. Was there anything so real as words? Yes, there had been things in his boyhood that he had not understood. He understood them now. Life suddenly became fiery colored to him. It seemed to him that he had been walking in fire. Why had he not known it? With his subtle smile, Lord Henry watched him. He knew the precise psychological moment when to say nothing. He felt intensely interested. He was amazed at the sudden impression that his words had produced, and remembering a book that he had read when he was sixteen, a book which had revealed to him much that he had not known before. He wondered whether Dorian Gray was passing through a similar experience. He had merely shot an arrow into the air. Had it hit the mark? How fascinating the lad was. Hallward painted away with that marvelous bold touch of his that had the true refinement, the perfect delicacy that, in art at any rate, comes only from strength. He was unconscious of the silence. Basil, I'm tired of standing, cried Dorian Gray suddenly. I must go out and sit in the garden. The air is stifling here. My dear fellow, I'm so sorry. When I'm painting, I can't think of anything else. But you never sat better. You were perfectly still. And I've caught the effect I wanted. The half-parted lips and the bright look in the eyes. I don't know what Harry's been saying to you, but he has certainly made you have the most wonderful expression. I suppose he has been paying you compliments. You mustn't believe a word that he says. He has certainly not been paying me compliments. Perhaps that's the reason I don't believe anything he has told me. You know you believe it all, said Lord Henry, looking at him with his dreamy, langorious eyes. I will go out to the garden with you. It's horribly hot in the studio. Basil, let us have something iced to drink. Something with strawberries in it. Certainly, Harry. Just touch the bell. When Parker comes in, I will tell him what you want. I've got to work up this background, so I'll join you later on. Don't keep Dorian too long. I've never been in better form for painting than I am today. This is going to be my masterpiece. It is my masterpiece as it stands. Lord Henry went out to the garden and found Dorian Gray burying his face in the great cool lilac blossoms, feverishly drinking in their perfume as if it had been wine came close to him and put his hand upon his shoulder. You're quite right to do that, he murmured. Nothing can cure the soul but the senses, just as nothing can cure the senses but the soul. The lad started and drew back. He was bareheaded, and the leaves had tossed his rebellious curls and tangled all their gilded threads. There was a look of fear in his eyes, such as people have when they are suddenly awakened. 
His finely chiseled nostrils quivered, and some hidden nerve shook the scarlet of his lips and left them trembling. Yes, continued Lord Henry. That was one of the great secrets of life, to cure the soul by means of the senses, and the senses by means of the soul. You are a wonderful creation. You know more than you think you know, just as you know less than you want to know. Dorian Gray frowned and turned his head away. He could not help liking the tall, graceful young man who was standing by him. His romantic, olive-colored face and worn expression interested him. There was something in his low, languid voice that was absolutely fascinating. His cool, white, flower-like hands had a curious charm. They moved as he spoke, like music, and seemed to have a language of their own. But he felt afraid of him, and ashamed of being afraid. Why had it been left for a stranger to reveal him to himself? He had known Basil Hallward for months, but the friendship between them had never altered him. Suddenly, there had come someone across his life who seemed to have disclosed to him life's mystery. And yet, what was there to be afraid of? He was not a schoolboy or a girl. It was absurd to be frightened. Let us go and sit in the shade, said Lord Henry. Parker has brought out the drinks, and if you stay any longer in this glare, you will be quite spoiled, and Basil will never paint you again. You must really not allow yourself to become sunburnt. It would be unbecoming. <laughs> what can it matter? cried Dorian Gray, laughing, as he sat down on the seat at the end of the garden. It should matter everything to you, Mr. Gray. Why? Because you have the most marvelous youth, and youth is the one thing worth having. I don't feel that, Lord Henry. No, you don't feel it now. Some day, when you're old and wrinkled and ugly, when thought has seared your forehead with its lines and passion branded your lip with its hideous fires, you will feel it. You will feel it terribly. Now, wherever you go, you charm the world. Will it always be so? You have a wonderfully beautiful face, Mr. Gray. Don't frown. You have. And beauty is a form of genius, is higher indeed than genius, as it needs no explanation. It is of the great facts of the world, like sunlight or springtime, or the reflection in dark waters of that silver shell we call the moon. It cannot be questioned. It has divine right of sovereignty. It makes princes of those who have it. You smile? Ah. When you have lost it, you won't smile. People say sometimes that beauty is only superficial. That may be so, but at least it's not so superficial as thought is. To me, beauty is the wonder of wonders. It is only shallow people who do not judge by appearances. The true mystery of the world is the visible, not the invisible. Yes, Mr. Gray, the gods have been good to you. But what the gods give, they quickly take away. You have only a few years in which to live really perfectly and fully. When your youth goes, your beauty will go with it. And then you will suddenly discover that there are no triumphs left for you, or have to content yourself with those mean triumphs that the memory of your past will make more bitter than defeats. Every month, as it wanes, brings you nearer to something dreadful. Time is jealous of you and wars against your lilies and your roses. You will become sallow and hollow-cheeked and dull-eyed. You will suffer horribly. Ah, realize your youth while you have it. Don't squander the gold of your days, listening to the tedious, trying to improve the hopeless failure, or giving away your life to the ignorant, the common, and the vulgar. These are the sickly aims, the false ideals of our age. Live. Live in the wonderful life that is in you. Let nothing be lost upon you. Be always searching for new sensations. Be afraid of nothing. A new hedonism. That is what our century wants. You might be its visible symbol. With your personality, there is nothing you could not do. The world belongs to you for a season. The moment I met you, I saw that you were quite unconscious of what you really are, of what you really might be. 
There was so much in you that charmed me that I felt I must tell you something about yourself. I thought how tragic it would be if you were wasted, for there is such a little time that your youth will last. Such a little time. The common hill flowers wither, but they blossom again. The laburnum will be as yellow next June as it is now. In a month, there will be the purple stars and the clematis. And a year after and a year after, the green night of its leaves will hold its purple stars. But we never get back our youth. The pulse of joy that beats in us at twenty becomes sluggish. Our limbs fail, our senses rot. We degenerate into hideous puppets, haunted by the memory of the passions of which we were too much afraid and the exquisite temptations that we had not the courage to yield. Youth. Youth. There is absolutely nothing in the world but youth. Dorian Gray listened, open-eyed and wondering. The spray of lilac fell from his hand upon the gravel. A furry bee came and buzzed around it for a moment. Then it began to scramble all over the oval, stellated globe of the tiny blossoms. He watched it with that strange interest in trivial things that we try to develop when things of higher import make us afraid, or when we are stirred by some new emotion for which we cannot find expression, or when some thought that terrifies us lays sudden siege to the brain and calls on us to yield. After a time, the bee flew away. He saw it creeping into the stained trumpet of a Tyrian convo vulvus. The flower seemed to quiver, and then swayed gently to and fro. Suddenly, the painter appeared at the door of the studio and made a staccato sign for them to come in. They turned to each other and smiled. "'I'm waiting,' he cried. "'Do come in. The light is quite perfect, and you can bring your drinks.' They rose up and sauntered down the walk together. Two green and white butterflies fluttered past them, and in the pear tree at the corner of the garden a thrush began to sing. "'You are glad you have met me, Mr. Gray,' said Lord Henry, looking at him. "'Yes, I am glad now. I wonder, shall I always be glad?' "'Always. That is a dreadful word. It makes me shudder when I hear it. Women are so fond of using it. They spoil every romance by trying to make it last forever. It is a meaningless word, too. The only difference between a caprice and a lifelong passion is the caprice lasts a little longer.' As they entered the studio, Dorn Gray put his hand upon Lord Henry's arm. "'In that case, let our friendship be a caprice,' he murmured, flushing at his own boldness, then stepped up on the platform and resumed his pose. Lord Henry flung himself into a large wicker armchair and watched him. The sweep and dash of the brush on the canvas made the only sound that broke the stillness, except when, now and then, Hallward stepped back to look at his work from a distance." In the slanting beams that streamed through the open doorway, the dust danced and was golden. The heavy scent of the roses seemed to brood over everything. After about a quarter of an hour, Hallward stopped painting. He looked for a long time at Dorian Gray, and then for a long time at the picture, biting the end of one of his huge brushes and frowning. "'It is quite finished,' he cried at last, and stooping down he wrote his name in long vermilion letters on the left corner of the canvas." Lord Henry came over and examined the picture. It was certainly a wonderful work of art, and a wonderful likeness as well. "'My dear fellow, I congratulate you most warmly,' he said. "'It is the fine portrait of modern times. Mr. Gray, come over and look at yourself.' The lad started, as if awakened from some dream. "'Is it really finished?' he murmured, stepping down from the platform. "'Quite finished!' said the painter, and you have sat splendidly today. I am awfully obliged to you. That is entirely due to me, broke in Lord Henry, isn't it, Mr. Gray? Dorian made no answer, but passed listlessly in front of his picture and turned towards it. When he saw it, he drew back, and his cheeks flushed for a moment with pleasure. A look of joy came into his eyes as if he had recognized himself for the first time. He stood there motionless and in wonder dimly conscious that Hallward was speaking to him, but not catching the meaning of his words. The sense of his own beauty came on him like a revelation. He had never felt it before. Basil Hallward's compliments had seemed to him to be merely the charming exaggeration of friendship. He had listened to them, laughed at them, forgotten them. 
they had not influenced his nature. Then had come Lord Henry Wanton, with his strange pangenic on youth, his terrible warning of its brevity. That had stirred him at the time, and now, as he stood gazing at the shadow of his own loveliness, the full reality of the description flashed across him. Yes, there would be a day when his face would be wrinkled and wise, and his eyes dim and colorless, the grace of his figure broken and deformed. The scarlet would pass away from his lips, and the gold steel from his hair. The life that was to make his soul would mar his body. He would become dreadful, hideous, and uncouth. As he thought of it, a sharp pang of pain struck through him like a knife and made each delicate fiber of his nature quiver. His eyes deepened into amethyst, and across them came the mist of tears. He felt as if a hand of ice had been laid upon his heart. "'Don't you like it?' cried Hallward at last, stung a little by the lad's silence, not understanding what it meant. "'Of course he likes it,' said Lord Henry. "'Who wouldn't like it? It's one of the greatest things in modern art. I will give you anything you like to ask for it. I must have it.' "'It is not my property, Harry. Whose property is it?' "'Dorian's, of course,' answered the painter. "'He is a very lucky fellow.' "'How sad it is,' murmured Dorian, with his eyes still fixed upon his own portrait. "'How sad it is I shall grow old and horrible and dreadful. "'But this picture will remain always young. "'It will never be older than this particular day of June. "'If it were only the other way. "'If it were only I who was to be always young in the picture that was to grow old.' For that, for that, I would give everything. Yes, there is nothing in the whole world I would not give. I would give my soul for that. You would hardly care for such an arrangement, Basil, cried Lord Henry, laughing. It would rather be hard lines on your work. I should object very strongly, Harry, said Hallward. Dorian Gray turned and looked at him. I believe you would, Basil. You like your art better than your friends. And I am no more to you than a green bronze figure, hardly as much, I dare say. The painter stared in amazement. It was so unlike Dorian to speak like that. What had happened? He seemed quite angry. His face was flushed and his cheeks burning. Yes, he continued, I am less to you than your ivory Hermes or your silver fawn. You will like them always. How long will you like me? Till I have my first wrinkle, I suppose. I know, now that when one loses one's good looks, whatever they may be, one loses everything. Your picture has taught me that. Lord Henry Wanton is perfectly right. Youth is the only thing worth having. When I find that I am growing old, I shall kill myself. Hallward turned pale and caught his hand. Dorian! Dorian! he cried. Don't talk like that. I have never had such a friend as you, and I shall never have such another. You are not jealous of material things, are you? You are finer than any of them. I am jealous of everything whose beauty does not die. I am jealous of the portrait you have painted of me. Why should it keep that I must lose? Every moment that passes takes something from me and gives something to it. Oh, if it were only the other way. If the picture could change and I could be always what I am now. Why did you paint it? It will mock me some day, mock me horribly. The hot tears welled into his eyes. He tore his hands away, and flinging himself on the divan, he buried his face in the cushions as though he were praying. "'This is your doing, Harry,' the painter said bitterly. Lord Henry shrugged his shoulders. "'It is the real Dorian Gray. That is all. It is not. If it is not, what have I to do with it?' "'You should have gone away when I asked you,' he muttered. "'I stayed when you asked me,' was Lord Henry's answer." Harry, I can't quarrel with my two best friends at once, but between you both, you have made me hate the finest piece of work I have ever done, and I will destroy it. What is it but canvas and color? I will not let it come across our three lives and mar them. Dorian Gray lifted his golden head from the pillow, and with pallid face and tear-stained eyes looked at him as he walked over to the deal painting table that was set beneath the high curtained window. What was he doing there? His fingers were straying about the litter of tin tubes and dry brushes seeking for something. Yes, it was for the long palette knife with its thin blade of lithe steel. He had found it at last. He was going to rip up the canvas. 
With a stifled sob, the lad leaped from the couch and, rushing over to Hallward, tore the knife out of his hand and flung it to the end of the studio. Don't, Basil, don't, he cried. It would be murder. I'm glad you appreciate my work at last, Dorian, the painter said coldly when he had recovered from his surprise. I never thought you would. Appreciate it? I am in love with it, Basil. It is part of myself. I feel that. Well, as soon as you are dry, you shall be varnished and framed and sent home. Then you can do what you like with yourself. And he walked across the room and rang the bell for tea. You will have tea, of course, Dorian. And so will you, Harry? Or do you object to such simple pleasures? I adore simple pleasures, said Lord Henry. They are the last refuge of the complex. But I don't like seams, except on the stage. What absurd fellows you are, both of you. I wonder who it was to find man as a rational animal. It was the most premature definition ever given. Man is many things, but he is not rational. I'm glad he is not, after all. Though, I wish you chaps would not squabble over the picture. You had much better let me have it, Basil. This silly boy doesn't really want it, and I really do. If you let anyone have it but me, Basil, I shall never forgive you, cried Dorian Gray. And I don't allow people to call me a silly boy. You know the picture is yours, Dorian. I gave it to you before it existed. And you know you have been a little silly, Mr. Gray, and that you don't really object to being reminded that you are extremely young. I should have objected very strongly this morning, Lord Henry. Ah, this morning? You have lived since then. There came a knock at the door, and the butler entered with a laden tea tray and set it upon a small Japanese table. There was a rattle of cups and saucers and the hissing of a fluted Gregorian urn. The two globe-shaped china dishes were brought in by a page. Dorian Gray went over and poured the tea. The two men sauntered languidly to the table and examined what was under the covers. "'Let us go to the theatre tonight,' said Lord Henry. "'There is sure to be something on somewhere. "'I have promised to dine at White's, but it is only with an old friend, "'so I can send him a wire to say that I am ill "'or that I am prevented from coming in consequence of a subsequent engagement. "'I think that would be a rather nice excuse. "'It would have all the surprise of candor.' It is such a bore putting on one's dress clothes, murmured Hallward. And when one has them on, they're so horrid. Yes, answered Lord Henry dreamily. The costume of the 19th century is detestable. It is so somber, so depressing. Sin is the only real color element left in modern life. You must really not say things like that before Dorian, Harry. Before which Dorian? The one who is pouring out tea for us, or the one in the picture? Before either. "'I should like to come to the theatre with you, Lord Henry,' said the lad. "'Then you shall come. And you will come too, Basil, won't you?' "'I can't, really. I would sooner not. I have a lot of work to do.' "'Well, then, you and I will go alone, Mr. Gray. I should like that awfully.' The painter bit his lip and walked over, cup in hand, to the picture. "'I shall stay with the real Dorian,' he said sadly. "'Is it the real Dorian?' cried the original of the portrait." strolling across to him. Am I really like that? Yes, you are just like that. How wonderful, Basil. At least you are like it in appearance, but it will never alter, sighed Hallward. That is something. What a fuss people make about fidelity, exclaimed Lord Henry. Why, even in love, it is purely a question for physiology. It has nothing to do with our own will. Young men want to be faithful and are not. Old men want to be faithless and cannot. That is all one can say. Don't go to the theater tonight, Dorian, said Hallward. Stop and dine with me. I can't, Basil. Why? Because I have promised Lord Henry Wanton to go with him. He won't like you the better for keeping your promises. He always breaks his own. I beg you not to go. Dorian laughed and shook his head. I entreat you. The lad hesitated and looked over at Lord Henry, who was watching them from the tea-table, with an amused smile. "'I must go, Basil,' he answered. "'Very well,' said Hallward, and he went over and laid down his cup on the tray. "'It is rather late, and as you have to dress, you had better lose no time. "'Goodbye, Harry. Goodbye, Dorian. Come and see me soon. Come tomorrow.' "'Certainly. You won't forget?' "'Oh, of course not,' cried Dorian.' And, Harry? 
Yes, Basil. Remember what I asked you when we were in the garden this morning? I have forgotten it. I trust you. I wish I could trust myself, said Lord Henry, laughing. Come, Mr. Gray, my handsome is outside. I can drop you at your own place. Goodbye, Basil. It has been a most interesting afternoon. As the door closed behind them, the painter flung himself down on the sofa, and a look of pain came into his face. Chapter 3 At half-past twelve the next day, Lord Henry Wanton strolled from Curzon Street over to the Albany to call on his uncle, Lord Fermor, a genial if somewhat rough-mannered old bachelor whom the outside world called selfish because it derived no particular benefit from him, but who was considered generous by society as he fed the people who amused him. His father had been our ambassador at Madrid when Isabel was young and prim unthought of, but had retired from the diplomatic service in a capricious moment of annoyance on not being offered the embassy at Paris, a post to which he considered that he was fully entitled by reason of his birth, his indolence, the good English of his dispatches, and his inordinate passion for pleasure. The son, who had been his father's secretary, had resigned along with his chief, somewhat foolishly, as was thought at the time, and on succeeding some months later to the title, had set himself to the serious study of the great aristocratic art of doing absolutely nothing. He had two large townhouses, but preferred to live in chambers, as it was less trouble, and took most of his meals at his club. He paid some attention to the management of his collieries in the Midland counties, excusing himself for this taint of industry on the ground that the one advantage of having coal was that it enabled a gentleman to afford the decency of burning wood on his own hearth. In politics, he was a Tory, except when the Tories were in office, during which period he roundly abused them for being a pack of radicals. He was a hero to his valet, who bullied him, and a terror to most of his relations, whom he bullied in turn. Only England could have produced him, and he always said that the country was going to the dogs. His principles were out of date, but there was a good deal to be said for his prejudices. When Lord Henry entered the room, he found his uncle sitting in a rough shooting coat, smoking a cheroot and grumbling over the times. "'Well, Harry,' said the old gentleman, "'what brings you out so early? "'I thought you dandies never got up till two "'and were not visible till five. "'Pure family affection, I assure you, Uncle George. "'I want to get something out of you.' "'Money, I suppose,' said Lord Firmer, making a wry face. "'Well, sit down and tell me all about it. "'Young people nowadays imagine that money is everything.' "'Yes,' murmured Lord Henry, settling his buttonhole in his coat. And when they grow older, they know it. But I don't want money. It is only people who pay their bills who want that, Uncle George, and I never pay mine. Credit is the capital of a younger son, and one lives charmingly upon it. Besides, I always deal with Dartmoor's tradesmen, and consequently they never bother me. What I want is information. Not useful information, of course. Useless information. Well... I can tell you anything that there is in an English blue book, Harry, although those fellows nowadays write a lot of nonsense. When I was in the diplomatic, things were much better. But I hear they let them in now by examination. What can you expect? Examinations, sir, are pure humbug from beginning to end. If a man is a gentleman, he knows quite enough. And if he's not a gentleman, whatever he knows is bad for him. Mr. Dorian Gray does not belong to blue books, Uncle George said Lord Henry languidly. "'Mr. Dorian Gray, who is he?' asked Lord Firmer, knitting his bushy white eyebrows. "'That is what I've come to learn, Uncle George, or rather, I know who he is. He is the last Lord Kelso's grandson. His mother was a Devereux, Lady Margaret Devereux. I want you to tell me about his mother. What was she like? Whom did she marry? You have known nearly everybody in your time, so you might have known her.' I am very much interested in Mr. Gray at present. I have only just met him. Kelso's grandson, echoed the old man. Kelso's grandson. Of course. I knew his mother intimately. I believe I was at her christening. She was an extraordinarily beautiful girl, Margaret Devereux, and made all the men frantic by running away with a penniless young fellow, a mere nobody, sir, a subaltern in a foot regiment or something of that kind. Certainly. I remember the whole thing as if it happened yesterday. The poor chap was killed in a duel at a spa a few months after the marriage. 
There was an ugly story about it. They said Kelso got some rascally adventurer, some Belgian brute, to insult his son-in-law in public. Paid him, sir, to do it. Paid him. That fellow spitted his man as if he had been a pigeon. The thing was hushed up, but egad, Kelso ate his chop alone at the club for some time afterwards. He brought his daughter back with him, I was told, and she never spoke to him again. Oh, yes. It was a bad business. The girl died, too. Died within a year. So she left a son, did she? I had forgotten that. What sort of boy is he? Is he like his mother? He must be a good-looking chap. He's very good-looking, assented Lord Henry. I hope he will fall into proper hands, continued the old man. He should have a pot of money waiting for him if Kelso did the right thing by him. His mother had money, too. All the Selby property came to her through her grandfather. Her grandfather hated Kelso, thought him a mean dog. He was, too. Came to Madrid once when I was there. Egad, I was ashamed of him. The Queen used to ask me about the English noble who was always quarrelling with the cabmen about their fares. They made quite a story of it. I didn't dare show my face at court for a month. I hope he treated his grandson better than he did the Jarvis. I don't know, answered Lord Henry. I fancy that the boy will be well off. He is not of age yet. He has Selby, I know. He told me so. And his mother was very beautiful? Margaret Devereux was one of the loveliest creatures I ever saw, Harry. What on earth induced her to behave as she did, I never could understand. She could have married anybody she chose. Carlington was mad after her. She was a romantic, though. All women of that family were. The men were a poor lot, but egad, women were wonderful. Carlington went on his knees to her, told me so himself. She laughed at him, and there wasn't a girl in London at the time who wasn't after him. And by the way, Harry, talking about silly marriages, what is this humbug your father tells me about Dartmoor wanting to marry an American? Ain't English girls good enough for him? It is rather fashionable to marry Americans just now, Uncle George. I'll back English women against the world, Harry, Lord Firmer said, striking his fist against the table. The betting is on the Americans. They don't last, I am told, muttered his uncle. A long engagement exhausts them, but they are capital at a steeplechase. They take things flying. I don't think Dartmoor has a chance. Who are her people? grumbled the old man. Has she got any? Lord Henry shook his head. American girls are as clever at concealing their parents as English women are at concealing their past, he said, rising to go. They are pork packers, I suppose. I hope so, Uncle George, for Dartmoor's sake. I am told that pork packing is the most lucrative profession in America, after politics. Is she pretty? She behaves as if she was beautiful. Most American women do. It is the secret of their charm. Why can't these American women stay in their own country? They're always telling us that it is the paradise for women. It is. That is the reason why, like Eve, they are so excessively anxious to get out of it, said Lord Henry. Goodbye, Uncle George. I shall be late for lunch if I stop any longer. Thanks for giving me the information I wanted. I always like to know everything about my new friends and nothing about my old ones. Where are you lunching, Henry? At Aunt Agatha's. I have asked myself and Mr. Gray. He is her latest protege. Humph. <laughs> Tell your Aunt Agatha, Harry, not to bother me any more with her charity appeals. I am sick of them. Why, the good woman thinks that I have nothing to do but to write her checks for her silly fads. All right, Uncle George, I'll tell her, but it won't have any effect. Philanthropic people lose all sense of humanity. It is their distinguishing characteristic. The old gentleman growled approvingly and rang the bell for his servant. Lord Henry passed the low arcade into Burlington Street and turned his steps in the direction of Berkeley Square. So that was the story of Dorian Gray's parentage. Crudely as it had been told to him, it had yet stirred him by its suggestion of a strange, almost modern romance— a beautiful woman risking everything for a mad passion, a few wild weeks of happiness cut short by a hideous, treacherous crime. Months of voiceless agony, and then a child born in pain, the mother snatched away by death, the boy left to solitude in the tyranny of an old and loveless man. Yes, it was an interesting background. It posed the lad. It made him more perfect, as it were. Beyond every exquisite thing that existed, there was something tragic. Worlds had to be in travail that the meanest flower might blow. And how charming he had been at dinner the night before, as with startled eyes and lips parted in frightened pleasure, he had sat opposite to him at the club, the red candle shade staining to a richer rose the wakening wonder of his face. Talking to him was like playing upon an exquisite violin. He answered to every touch and thrill of the bow. 
there was something terribly enthralling in the exercise of influence. No other activity was like it. To project one's soul into some gracious form and let it tarry there for a moment. To hear one's own intellectual views echoed back to one with the added music of passion and youth. To convey one's temperament into another as though it were a subtle fluid or a strange perfume. There was a real joy in that, perhaps the most satisfying joy left to us in an age so limited and vulgar as our own, an age so grossly carnal in its pleasures and grossly common in its aims. He was a marvelous type, too, this lad, whom, by so curious a chance, he had met in Basil's studio, or could be fashioned into a marvelous type at any rate. Grace was his, and the white purity of boyhood, and beauty such as old Greek marbles kept for us. There was nothing that one could not do with him. He could be made a titan or a toy. What a pity it was that such beauty was destined to fade. And Basil? From a psychological point of view, how interesting he was. The new manner in art, the fresh mode of looking at life, suggested so strangely by the merely visible presence of one who was unconscious of it all. A silent spirit that dwelt in dim woodland and walked unseen in open field, suddenly showing herself, dryad-like and not afraid, because in his soul who sought for her there had been awakened that wonderful vision to which alone are wonderful things revealed. The mere shapes and patterns of things becoming, as it were, refined, and gaining a kind of symbolic value, as though they were themselves patterns of some other or more perfect form whose shadow they made real. How strange it all was! He remembered something like it in history. Was it not Plato, that artist in thought, who had first analyzed it? Was it not Bonarotti who had carved it in the colored marbles of a sonnet sequence? But in our own century it was strange. But in our own century it was strange. Yes, he would try to be to Dorian Gray what, without knowing it, the lad was to the painter who had fashioned the wonderful portrait. He would seek to dominate him. Had already, indeed half done so. He would make that wonderful spirit his own. There was something fascinated in this sun of love and death. Suddenly, he stopped and glanced up at the houses. He found that he had passed his aunt some distance, and smiling to himself, turned back. When he entered the somewhat somber hall, the butler told him that they had gone in to lunch. He gave one of the footmen his hat and stick and passed into the dining room. "'Late as usual, Harry,' cried his aunt, shaking her head at him. He invented a fossil excuse, and having taken the vacant seat next to her, looked around to see who was there. Dorian bowed to him shyly from the end of the table, a flush of pleasure stealing into his cheek. Opposite was the Duchess of Harley, a lady of admirable good nature and good temper, much liked by everyone who knew her, and of those ample architecture proportions that in women who are not duchesses are described by contemporary historians as stoutness. Next to her sat, on her right, Sir Thomas Burden, a radical member of Parliament who followed his leader in public life and in private life followed the best cooks, dining with the Tories and thinking with the Liberals, in accordance with a wise and well-known rule. The post on her left was occupied by Mr. Erskine of Treadley, an old gentleman of considerable charm and culture who had fallen, however, into bad habits of silence, having, as he explained once to Lady Agatha, said everything that he had to say before he was thirty. His own neighbor was Mrs. Vandeleur, one of his aunt's oldest friends, a perfect saint amongst women, but so dreadfully dowdy that she reminded one of a badly bound hymn book. Fortunately for him, she had on the other side Lord Foddle, a most intelligent middle-aged mediocrity, as bald as a minstrel statement in the House of Commons, with whom she was conversing in that intensely earnest manner which is the one unpardonable error as he remarked once himself, that all really good people fall into, and from which none of them ever quite escape. "'We are talking about poor Dartmoor, Lord Henry,' cried the Duchess, nodding pleasantly to him across the table. "'Do you think he will really marry this fascinating young person?' "'I believe she has made up her mind to propose to him, Duchess.' "'How dreadful!' exclaimed Lady Agatha. "'Really, someone should interfere.' "'I am told, on excellent authority, that her father keeps an American dry-goods store,' said Sir Thomas Burden, looking supercilious. "'My uncle has already suggested pork-packing, Sir Thomas.' "'Dry-goods? What are the—what what, what, what are American dry-goods?' asked the Duchess, raising her large hand in wonder and accentuating the verb. "'American novels,' answered Lord Henry, helping himself to some quail. The Duchess looked puzzled. "'Don't mind him, my dear,' whispered Lady Agatha. "'He never means anything that he says.' 
When America was discovered, said the radical member, and he began to give some wearisome facts, like all people who try to exhaust a subject, he exhausted his listeners. The Duchess sighed and exercised her privilege of interruption. I wish to goodness it never had been discovered at all, she exclaimed. Really? Our girls have no chance nowadays. It is most unfair. Perhaps after all, America has never been discovered, said Erskine. I myself would say that it had been merely detected. Oh, but I have seen specimens of the inhabitants, answered the Duchess vaguely. I must confess that most of them are extremely pretty, and they dress well, too. They get all their dresses in Paris. I wish I could afford to do the same. They say when a good American dies, they go to Paris, chuckled Sir Thomas, who had a large wardrobe of humorous cast-off clothes. Really? And where do bad Americans go when they die? inquired the Duchess. They go to America, murmured Lord Henry. Sir Thomas frowned. I'm afraid that your nephew is prejudiced against that great country, he said to Lady Agatha. I have traveled all over it in cars provided by the directors, who, in such matters, are extremely civil. I assure you it is an education to visit it. But must we really see Chicago in order to be educated? asked Mr. Erskine plaintively. I don't feel up to the journey. Sir Thomas waved his hand. Mr. Erskine of Treadley has the world on his sleeves. We practical men like to see things, not to read about them. The Americans are an extremely interesting people. They are absolutely reasonable. I think that is their distinguishing characteristic. Yes, Mr. Erskine, an absolutely reasonable people. I assure you there is no nonsense about the Americans. How dreadful, cried Lord Henry. I can stand brute force, but brute reason is quite unbearable. There is something unfair about its use. It is hitting below the intellect. I do not understand you, said Sir Thomas, growing rather red. I do, Lord Henry, murmured Mr. Erskine with a smile. Paradoxes are all very well in their way, rejoined the baronet. Was that a paradox? asked Mr. Erskine. I did not think so. Perhaps it was. Well, the way of paradoxes is the way of truth. To test reality, we must see it on the tightrope. When the verities become acrobats, we can judge them. Dear me, said Lady Agatha, how you men argue. I am sure I can never make out what you're talking about. Oh, Harry, I am quite vexed with you. Why do you try to persuade our nice Mr. Dorian Gray to give up the East End? I assure you, he would be quite invaluable. They would love his playing. "'I want him to come play to me,' cried Lord Henry, smiling, as he looked down the table and caught a bright, answering glance. "'But they are so unhappy in Whitechapel,' continued Lady Agatha. "'I could sympathize with everything except suffering,' said Lord Henry, shrugging his shoulders. "'I cannot sympathize with that. It is too ugly, too horrible, too distressing. There is something terribly morbid in the modern sympathy with pain. One should sympathize with the color, the beauty, the joy of life.' The less said about life's sores, the better. Still, the East End is a very important problem, remarked Sir Thomas with a grave shake of the head. Quite so, answered the young lord. It is the problem of slavery, and we try to solve it by amusing the slaves. The politician looked at him keenly. What change do you propose, then? he asked. Lord Henry laughed. I don't desire to change anything in England except the weather, he answered. I am quite content with philosophic contemplation. But as the 19th century has gone bankrupt through an over-expenditure of sympathy, I would suggest that we should appeal to science to put us straight. The advantage of the emotions is that they lead us astray, and the advantage of science is that it is not emotional. But we have such grave responsibilities, ventured Mrs. Vandeleur timidly. Terribly grave, echoed Lady Agatha. Lord Henry looked over at Mr. Erskine. Humanity takes itself too seriously. It is the world's original sin. If the cavemen had known how to laugh, history would have been different. You're really very comforting, warbled the Duchess. I have always felt rather guilty when it came, when I came to see your dear aunt, for I take no interest at all in the East End. For the future, I shall be able to look in her face without a blush. A blush is very becoming, Duchess, remarked Lord Henry. Only when one is young, she answered. When an old woman like myself blushes, it is a very bad sign. Ah, Lord Henry, I wish you would tell me how to become young again. He thought for a moment. Can you remember any great error that you committed in your early days, Duchess? He asked, looking at her across the table. A great many, I fear, she cried. Then commit them over again, he said gravely. To get back to one's youth, one has merely to repeat one's follies. A 
a delightful theory, she exclaimed. I must put it into practice. A dangerous theory, came from Sir Thomas's tight lips. Lady Agatha shook her head, but not could not help being amused. Mr. Erskine listened. Yes, he continued, it is one of the great secrets of life. Nowadays, most people die of a sort of creeping common sense and discover it when it is too late that the only things one never regrets are one's mistakes. A laugh ran round the table. He played with the idea and grew willful, tossed it into the air and transformed it, let it escape and recaptured it, made it iridescent with fancy and winged with paradox. The praise of folly, as he went on, soared into a philosophy, and philosophy herself became young, and catching the mad music of pleasure, wearing, one might fancy, her wine-stained robe and wreath of ivy danced like a piquant over the hills of life, and mocked the slow Silenus for being sober. Facts fled before her like frightened forest things. Her white feet trod the huge press at which wise Omar sits, till the seething grape juice rose round her bare limbs in waves of purple bubbles, or crawled in red foam over the vat's black, dripping, sloping sides. It was an extraordinary improvisation. He felt that the eyes of Dorian Gray were fixed on him, and the consciousness that amongst his audience there was one whose temperament he wished to fascinate seemed to give his wit keenness and to lend color to his imagination. He was brilliant, fantastic, irresponsible. He charmed his listeners out of themselves, and they followed his pipe laughing. Dorian Gray never took his gaze off him, but sat like one under a spell, smiles chasing each other over his lips and wonder growing grave in his darkening eyes. At last, liveried in the costume of the age, reality entered the room in the shape of a servant to tell the Duchess that her carriage was waiting. She wrung her hands in mock despair. "'How annoying!' she cried. "'I must go. I have to call for my husband at the club to take him to some absurd meeting at Willis's room where he is going to be in the chair. If I am late, he is sure to be furious, and I couldn't have a scene in this bonnet. It is far too fragile. A harsh word would ruin it. No?' I must go, dear Agatha. Goodbye, Lord Henry. You were quite delightful and dreadfully demoralizing. I am sure I don't know what to say about your views. You must come and dine with us some night. Tuesday? Are you disengaged Tuesday? For you I would throw over anybody, Duchess, said Lord Henry with a bow. Ah, that is very nice and very wrong of you, she cried. So mind you come. And she swept out of the room, followed by Lady Agatha and the other ladies. When Lord Henry had sat down again, Mr. Erskine moved around, and taking a chair close to him, placed his hand upon his arm. "'You talk books away,' he said. "'Why don't you write one?' "'I am too fond of reading books to care to write them, Mr. Erskine. I should like to write a novel, certainly, a novel that would be as lovely as a Persian carpet and as unreal. But there is no literary public in England for anything except newspapers, primers, and encyclopedias. Of all people in the world, the English have the least sense of the beauty of literature.' "'I fear you are right,' answered Mr. Erskine. "'I myself used to have literary ambitions, but I gave them up long ago. "'And now, my dear young friend, if you will allow me to call you so, "'may I ask if you really meant all that you said to us at lunch?' "'I quite forget what I said,' smiled Lord Henry. "'Was it all very bad?' "'Very bad indeed. "'In fact, I consider you extremely dangerous, "'and if anything happens to our good Duchess, "'we shall all look to you as being primarily responsible.' but I should like to talk to you about life. The generation into which I was born was tedious. Some day, when you are tired of London, come down to Treadley and expound to me your philosophy of pleasure over some admirable burgundy I am fortunate enough to possess. I shall be charmed. A visit to Treadley would be a great privilege. It has a perfect host and a perfect library. You will complete it, answered the old gentleman with a courteous bow. And now I must bid goodbye to your excellent aunt. I am due at the Athenaeum, it is the hour when we sleep there. All of you, Mr. Erskine? Forty of us in forty armchairs. We are practicing for an English Academy of Letters. Lord Henry laughed and rose. I'm going to the park, he cried. As he was passing out of the door, Dorian Gray touched him on the arm. Let me come with you, he murmured. But I thought you had promised Basil Hallward to go and see him, answered Lord Henry. I would sooner come with you. Yes, I feel I must come with you. Do let me. "'And you will promise to talk to me all the time? "'No one talks so wonderfully as you do.' "'Ah, I have talked quite enough for today,' said Lord Henry, smiling. "'All I want now is to look at life. "'You may come and look at it with me if you care to.'" This concludes Classics You Slept Through's reading of The Picture of Dorian Gray through Chapter 3. 
Join us on the next episode to discuss what we just read. Hit us up on all the social medias at CYSTpod. Peace.